I was doing research, as you do, on corsets the other day, when I found this gem on page 11 of the London Journal, Ladies Supplement from 1897. In the 19th century, print culture in general exploded due to technological advancements, and women's magazines became increasingly numerous and popular. Nowadays, they're often collected for their delectable fashion plates, but they also hold tidbits and secrets about Victorian lives that are generally not available elsewhere. So what is special about this one? This column is called Corsets and How to Wear Them, and includes a rather bizarre technique to put on a corset, so I thought I would put it to the test. Will this give me a better fitted corset? Let's find out. Let's go back in time. The first instruction reads, wear nothing under the corset but a silk or lyle thread knitted vest. A first layer under the corset has been the standard for centuries. Originally the chemise, towards the end of the century combinations were introduced, where the chemise is combined with the ever more popular drawers into one nifty onesie. Towards the end of the century, some vests also became popular to reduce bulk under the corset, and some were connected to attempts at reforms in dress for better health. Unfortunately, I do not have a vest, so instead I will be trying this with my combinations. It instructs me to put drawers over the vest, keeping the bulk and the yoke beneath the waist. Again, to put all the bulk away from the waistline. It says nothing else belongs under corsets. The next instruction is a little curious. It reads, with a pair of long silk laces, lace in the usual way, but with the draw holes a little lower than the belt line. I have read consistently that silk laces are recommended by the Victorians, but for now these cotton laces will have to do. If you are unfamiliar with the draw holes, you may have heard them being referred to as bunny loops. These are two loops left in the laces where the corset will be drawn. Usually I position this at the waistline of the corset, but this tells me to put them a little lower. Okay. It says to leave the lacing as undone or loose as possible. And then, take a rough Turkish towel, double, and hold one end by the chin, pressed against the breast so that the towel hangs doubled over the front of the body, almost to the knees. Hook the corsets loosely around the body with the towel inside. Now, I may have misinterpreted this, but I read this as being instructed to put on a corset with a towel inside. Let's see. A Turkish towel, as far as I could identify in what it could have meant to the Victorians, is a large piece of fabric, usually made of cotton or linen. It was improved in the 17th century by Ottoman weavers, who introduced an extra warp loop in the twill weave, creating the pile in the fabric. I imagine then that this is not much different from modern towels other than its large size. My modern towel, sadly, will have to do. Well, here we are. This is a flattering look, isn't it? The next instruction is to start to slowly draw in the laces from the bottom up. Then to stop, bend forward and pull the bottom of the corset with one hand. At the same time, pull the towel slowly up with the other for a space of a few inches. Then draw a little tighter the bottom of the lacing. I may be more skeptical now than I was at the beginning. I am meant to bend forward and drop the towel while pulling down the corset. It says work the hips into place by twisting to right and left. Eventually, when the towel is drawn out, pull the laces taut. Tie firmly either at back or crossed and drawn at the front and tied under one edge of the busk. I will tie at the back as usual. Some corsets also had hooks where you could hook your laces and keep the bulk out of the waist. Now the next instruction is something that goes against one of the essential points I've learned about wearing corsets. I have always heard that the back of the corset should have an even gap. That means that the two corset edges should be parallel, which means the corset is fit properly through the bust, waist and hips. Our lady here though says, 
the back opening must present a slender V shape, meeting at the bottom. This indicates that the bust should be a little looser and the hips a little tighter. I cannot quite explain this instruction, it confuses me, but nevertheless I shall do it. It then instructs, don't wear a corset cover or slip bodice except when it's fully boned as a blouse lining. A corset cover was a typical item in a Victorian lady's wardrobe, sometimes called a camisole towards the end of the century. Its purpose was to smooth out the lines of the corset so that edges, ridges, busk, etc. was not visible under tight-fitting bodices. The bone bodice was another structural garment which became popular due to its provision in the bust. The next few instructions are to do with the fit of the overclothes. It is incredibly clear that the point of these instructions is to keep the waist clear of bulk, since that is the emphasis point of the silhouette. It says, the upper skirt should not have a band, but be flatly fitted to the hips. A small hook on the busk prevents the skirts from riding up in the front. My 1890s skirt unfortunately does have a waistband, but I was already wary of bulk when I made it, so I made it a narrow one inch and I did not interface or line it to keep it as flat as possible. This will have to do, but this is something I'll keep in mind for future makes. You might also notice that my corset does not presently have a hook at the front to keep the skirts in place, but this is something I've noticed on extant corsets. I will baste one on for the moment and if I like it or feel it is useful, I'll sew it onto my corset. About three seconds in, I wish I had done this before putting it on. The instructions take a slight step back and say, except for slender figures, so not me, the underskirt basted to the lower edge of corsets is advisable. This may be a very modern reaction since it was not uncommon to be sewn into clothes in some centuries, but I find this very odd. I imagine that by underskirt they meant the petticoat since the 1890s had moved away from the layered scats of the 1880s. However, I'll do it for the YouTube. This was incredibly awkward to do. I imagine these instructions were aimed at wealthy women who not only had the leisure and time to do this, but also someone on hand to help them, as I clearly was unable to do the back. The article then concludes, It is not likely that a few hours of tight corsets put on this way can injure a woman if there is no dragging weight at the same time. This is a very convoluted sentence to me. Firstly, it does not reassure me in any way that this is a good way to put on a corset. Secondly, it seems to imply that I should be tight lacing my corset. Now, tight lacing as a practice was done by a small percentage of society, particularly very wealthy women, where they tighten their corsets to the utmost, often leading to discomfort, pain, and perhaps even medical issues. Some women only did it for evening parties or dinners, as this instruction seems to imply. However, here I have followed all of the instructions above without tight lacing. I am perfectly comfortable in my corset. It then releases an utmost surprise at the very end of the article. For ordinary housewear, no corsets of any kind should be worn. The body requires to breathe from the pores of the skin. I'm even more confused now. From the 1840s onwards, the great corset question was thoroughly discussed, written about and opinionated on. The corset question was essentially to corset or not to corset. But once the arguments are dissected, it's actually to tight lace or not a tight lace question. More on that once my research is concluded. Nevertheless, the end of the 19th century had seen the rise of the dress reform movement, where a small section of society was pushing to disregard many aspects of fashionable dress for the sake of health and hygiene. This seems to fit with our lady writer's sentence here, where she advises no corset should be worn in the house. It then concludes with, these suggestions to plump women are given by an artist who has made a study of the subject in her own case. 
I love this last sentence. I wonder why the artist was necessary. But it does give us a clue. One of the veins of the dress reform movement could be seen in what is sometimes called artistic dress, which features looser shapes and fashions inspired by the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. It seems this lady was a defender of wearing the corset for outings or special occasions and in these to lace tightly for a few hours, but to disregard it altogether when at home. This supports the narrative that the corset was worn for aesthetic purposes to create a flattering figure, which was not needed at home. And here is my corset in skirts post following this advice. Just for fun, here is how I would normally put on my corset. It is much faster and simpler and the result is… similar? <laughs> Perhaps this lady's opinion was not an overarching Victorian secret, but instead a personal preference. I think I will stick to mine. <laughs> 